in my notes, but parts of it are so small. I can't see between my shield and this, so. Maybe looking a little bit on my phone because I can zoom in a little bit. So, we are doing Pilgrim's Progress today, as Miss Edwards already told you. But we're doing something that we do every few years with our fifth and sixth graders. And it's a lesson that we call Guard Your Heart. And on the slide there, I have a picture of a heart with a key in it. And you'll see that go throughout the slides here and there. Why do you think I put a picture of a heart with a key in it? Now, that's a good idea. Okay, God's the key to your heart. That's not really what I picked it for, but that's a great idea. Good job. Jaden. So we have the control to lock it so nothing can get in. That is really why I picked it. We are in control of what goes in our heart. Right? Things that we watch, things that we listen to, things that we see. We have a choice to either watch, listen, or not watch and listen. And so our verse that I put up here is Proverbs 4, 23. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. God tells us to guard our heart because oftentimes it's really hard for us to guard our heart. There's a lot out there that we get to see and hear. And walking down the street, you may hear things. You know, going down the street to your neighbor's house, you may hear things that may not be as God-honoring as they should be. Not much you can do about that if it's just in passing. But there are times that we have a choice. We have a choice on that. So about, it's probably been about five or six weeks ago now, you all took a technology survey, or most of you did. A few of you missed it, I think, but most of you did. You remember taking that technology survey? That was for preparation for today's chapel. So I have the data part for you, because I'm the math person, you know. So I asked a question about how many people have cell phones in the fifth and sixth grade? I'm gonna look on my phone. Can you see it up there on the screen? It's been interesting because we've done this survey many times. I've changed it a little bit. And the numbers have changed a little bit. So about two thirds of you converted for sixth graders from my percentages to my fractions. Um, two thirds of you have a cell phone. So those of you that are home telling your parents I'm the only one that doesn't have a cell phone, wrong. There's about a third of you that don't. Okay, so about one in three of you are cell phoneless. And that's not a bad thing. Okay. That number has gone up a little bit since the last time we did it. Last time it was a little less people had cell phones. Then I asked a question about, I asked lots of questions. Not all of them made it into our chapel because otherwise you would be here all day. Um, television and movies. So I asked the question about how many TVs in your home. This number did change from the last time I'd asked that question. And about 40% of you say five or more televisions in your house. That's about one in four kids in here have at least five televisions. But if you look at the purple, that's four. And you combine it with that, that's over 55% of our households have more than four, four or more televisions. That's a lot of TVs, isn't it? Some of you don't have any TVs. And I, I, I know a little bit about that because some of your parents have shared that with us. This next question I changed because things have changed a lot in the last couple of years. I used to just ask, do you have access to cable television? But a lot of us have cut the cord on cable, or your parents have, and they have a streaming device like Amazon Prime, or Netflix, or Hulu. So I'm kind of including all that, or Disney Plus, okay? 88% of you are pretty sure that you have one of those items at your house. It means you have access to on-demand television. Now, I will tell you, when I was little, we didn't have cable television. We had four stations. 
four, six, 10, and channel 34, which is PBS where Sesame Street is. That were my, those were our four channels. And Ms. Miller and I were talking yesterday that we didn't even have remotes to our television. If we wanted to get up and watch something else, you got up out of your seat and you flipped the channel. And then when we got our first remote television, it was a long cord that connected to the television and you could sit on the, the couch and flip it, but then you can also trip your brother or sister as they were going through the you know, Might not be good for your remote. Wouldn't last very long. Okay. Um, how many hours of TV do you watch a day? This one, I was actually pleasantly surprised. Okay. So a third of you, almost a third of you say you only watch about an hour a day. That's probably because you're busy doing math homework, I know. Um, no, it's because you're doing sports. 38% of you said two hours a day. Some of you need more homework because you're doing four hours of television a day. The purple part, 7% of you. No, they're using all their study hall time wisely. Is that what it is? Okay. But then, this is always the part that you're interested in. I, I took all of your data for your favorite TV shows. Now, don't show the slide just yet. The next slide is a, something called a word cloud. So when I put the data in, the more times that show has been picked, the bigger the font gets to be on this next slide. So if it's got a really big font and it's really easy to read, those are the most popular. And if it's really tiny, Somebody in here likes it, but not a lot of people like it. All right, go ahead and show the slide. Yes, Ranger Things made it up there. Bigger than Star Wars. Okay. All right. Quiet it back down. You can look at it for just a second. So that finished our TV part of our survey. And then we moved into watching movies. Now, that has changed in the last year because I used to ask how many times did you go to the movies? Well, have very many of you been able to go to the movies in the last year? Yeah. No, because the movie theaters were closed for a good portion of our last year, Jax. I don't know where you were going, but most of it was. Recently you could go, but in the last year you probably couldn't go a whole lot. So I changed it to either going to the movies or watching a movie with your family or with your friends. So we'll look at that data next, and then we're going to talk a little bit about movie ratings. So go ahead and flip, there you go. So once a week, so maybe it's your Friday night family thing, kind of like what we do in our house, 45% say they get to watch a movie. Um, a few times a year, I'm not sure if you thought that meant you were going to the movies. I don't know, maybe you only watch movies a few times a year, but that was like 25% of you that said you only watch movies a few times a year. Nobody said never. Okay, so you can see there are pie charts. Pie charts are wonderful things for us to see the whole picture. Now, you may or may not be aware, but movies are rated. Did you know that? Okay. So. I'm going to go through the movie ratings because that's part of what we're going to talk about today. First one is G-rated. G-rated movies are for general audience. There's not, honestly not a lot of movies that are G-rated today. Things like Toy Story 3 are G-rated. Okay. Um, cannot have any content that's generally considered offensive. So even mild humor, like what I would consider fifth and sixth grade humor, and where's Diego? <laughs> Probably wouldn't make a G-rated movie, Diego. Okay, he knows what I'm talking about, but anyway. So G-rated movies are really just very low key. There's nothing in it that's gonna really offend anyone. There's not any language in it, right? Your little, your little brothers and sisters can watch them just fine. Nothing super scary. Okay, next one is PG, and that's parental guidance. That means your parents should probably know what's in the movie, because there might be some things in there that are 
possibly a little scary or some things, but not a whole lot. The next one is PG-13. What is the 13 for? Emily. 13 and older. It's recommended for that age group. How many of you are in here are 13? I know one. Okay. Rest of you are still waiting for that moment to become 13. There's a lot of movies we watch that are rated PG-13. Now, it's up to your parents, okay? Um, I'm not saying you can't, but I will tell you something. When I was growing up, there was no PG-13 rating. It was just PG. So if you are watching a movie from 94, 1984, like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, <clears throat> that is a PG rated movie, but if it was made today, it would be qualified as a PG-13 because there's some scary parts in it like the snakes. I, I have the same love for snakes as Indiana Jones, which is no love at all. So that movie would be considered PG-13. So if you're watching an old movie, a classic from way back when, it may be a PG-13 movie today because it might have scary elements, it might have more language in it. The next movie rating is R. No one under the age of 17 can go to the movie theater without an adult with them to go see rated R movie. Okay? A lot more language, a lot more violence sometimes. Sometimes there are scenes that you should not be watching as a child. Okay? And the last category is an NC-17, and you, they don't even show these in the actual movie theaters. So these are things that you definitely should not be watching. So let's see what our fifth and sixth graders watch. Okay, so rated G did not even make the list. That's the highest rated movie, so all of you have moved past rated G. PG, Beauty and the Beast, Sing, Moana, Trolls, The Secret Life of Pets, those are all PG movies. PG-13, Mulan, the, the live action that was released last December. Wonder Woman 1984. Listen right now, please. You can look. Rogue One, Star Wars, that's a PG-13. Examples of rated R movies, Joker, The American Sniper, Deadpool, 1917, that was released last fall, I think, or winter. And in NC-17, some of you said you have seen those. I'm thinking of Maybe you didn't know what it was. Okay, now, favorite movies of our fifth and sixth graders. I think Mrs. Mack will be very happy to see some of these. Some of the top, Where the Red Fern Grows, and The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. Good job, this is back. Okay, another area, video games. question I asked was what types of video game systems, and this has obviously changed over the years. That's why I always put the other, because I can't keep track of all of them. Go ahead, go to the next slide. Looks like the Wii is still pretty popular, but Nintendo Switch was the winner, with Xbox One being a close second, okay? Now, some of you have multiple game systems, and that represents that up there. And I don't know what all the others are because I didn't ask you to list them for me. So you may have other game systems, like I didn't put all the handheld devices in and all that. All right, video game ratings kind of follow our movie ratings, except they are labeled differently. Did you know on every box there is a little rating for your video games? Go to our next slide. We'll cover that in just a minute. 
So these are our ratings. You have E, C, E, E10, T, M, and A, O. Have you ever seen those little rectangles on your video game boxes that tell you the rating? Okay. Our biggest category is purple. Okay, keep that in mind because we're going to come back to that. Early childhood, I know you put up there because I figured you were all past that. Those are like your little toddler games. But E is intended for everyone. So no matter what your age is, it's safe for you to play that one. Okay? E with a little T and a 10, or 10, sorry, E and a 10, that is for 10 and up. Okay? On our next one, we have T for team. Like Super Smash Brothers is team. Okay? That's what it is. Okay? So you can see up there that that contains some violence. It's probably because you are smashing each other for violence. Okay? But it is pretty minimal as far as there's no blood and gore. M. M was our purple category. That means it was our largest amount of the highest rated game that our intermediate school plays. M stands for mature audiences. That would be like rated R movies. Okay? Those would be very similar to each other. The content is generally suitable for ages 17 and up. Last one is AO, which is adults only. Okay. Hopefully you don't have any of those at your house, but you might. Okay. So those are the labels that our country puts on all of our video games to help parents know what would be good for their kids to play, what's suitable for their kids to play. But let's see what our favorite video games were. I gave this survey, listen, two years ago, do you know what the highest game was for our fifth and sixth grade? Fortnite. Still on there, but not quite as popular as it was two years ago. Alright, so, that brings us to our last Topic, and then we're going to talk just about a few things before Miss Edwards comes. And that's on music. Okay? Listen. Listen. There are two types of music, pretty much two general categories. You have the secular music, and you have our Christian music. Okay? Secular and Christian. Secular is just like people that sing... They aren't singing necessarily for God's glory, they're just singing because they think that they have the best voice in the world, okay? Christian music, same thing, except now they are singing about God or their love for God or things like that, okay? So, let's look at our results on percentages here. It's okay, I'm going to go through it. So, the rating was one through five, one being you hardly ever listen to secular music or you do not listen to it, five being you listen to it a lot. And so if you go from left to right, for those of you that can't see the numbers, about 10% of you hardly ever listen to secular music, 24% of you sometimes, and it keeps going on, we have 20%, 18%, and then 28, almost 28% of you lot listen to it all the time. Christian music goes from 4%, hardly ever listen to it, all the way up to number five, which is about a fourth of you, okay? Listen to it like all the time. So you can kind of see where we are. 
Now, our favorite secular music. I tease my kids about Billy Eilish. Okay, and then our favorite Christian music artists. Some of them I had to look up because you gave me clues like, I really like this song, but I don't know who sings it. And I had to go find out who sang the song. So. But I figured that out. Now, we looked at a lot of data, so I'm going to ask you to stop talking and listen for just a minute, and then Ms. Edwards will come and wrap things up. We looked at a lot of data. We started our lesson with guarding your heart, right? Some of the things that we choose into, to let into our heart, some of the music, some of the TV shows, some of the movies, some of the video games we play, are probably not really what we should be focusing on. We can say all we want. I'm just listening to the music because I like the beat. But there's a whole lot of words that go with some of those things that get into your brain. You know because I make you sing silly songs in class. You know, and if you can remember those songs, you will remember them until you are old and decrepit. You will be singing not a horn square, all right? You will all remember that song, okay? Those words still get into your brain. If you are filling up your mind with all those things that maybe you shouldn't be, it's, it's there. I would appreciate if you could stop talking, please. Thank you. We've gotta be careful. We hold the key to our heart. We can choose to lock it out, and only watch things that are God-honoring and pleasing and to listen to things that are God-honoring and pleasing. Doesn't mean every secular artist is horrible. Not at all, okay? But we have to choose and be careful. So, Ms. Edwards is going to come and do the second part of our lesson for today. I'm going to go ahead. on our remote instruction days um, last month. And uh, thanks to Mrs. Hoyt for taking time over um, the last couple of weeks to kind of compile all of that so that you guys could get that visual of what all of your answers put together looked like. And I wanted to give you another visual today and try to help you understand, like Ms. Hoyt um, gave you a little bit of info about why we are gonna be talking more about music, why we're gonna be talking specifically about Christian music, and why and how guarding your heart is so important, okay? When Proverbs talks about guarding our heart, what that means for us, for you, as fifth and sixth grade young men and women, is being careful of the things that you let into your eyes and into your ears, because those are the things that get into our hearts. Okay? That's what God's Word teaches us, is that what we entertain ourselves with, what we listen to, what we read, what we watch, the games we play, those things that we surround ourselves with, those things get into our hearts. And the reason it's so important to guard those is because God's Word also tells us that those things that we put in are going to come out in some way. And let me give you an example of this. I understand we have a birthday girl in the audience today. Is that right? Is it today? All right. Diane Angel of Quincy. Aggie has a birthday today. Aggie, happy birthday. Is there anybody else just so I know I'm not missing anybody? Anybody else have a double birthday? Okay. All right. Well, so let's just say that I wanted to make Aggie cupcakes for her birthday. Okay. And even if you don't like cooking or baking very much, I think that you guys will understand the point I'm trying to make with my little basket of ingredients here, all right? I brought my mixing bowl, 
and I brought some ingredients that I need you guys to help me decide if they are the best choices of things that I should put into Aggie's cupcakes, okay? And be serious, all right? Like there aren't any worms in there, okay? Intermediate teachers, we've had some experience with that, right? Okay, I'm not putting any worms in her cupcakes. All right, I brought some eggs. Okay, I should put eggs in her cupcakes. Oh, here's my water bottle. I, won't do that. I brought some taco seasoning. No. I have some sugar. Yes. Sugar needs to go in cupcakes. I brought some oil. Yes. I have an onion. Now remember, I'm making these cupcakes. Her brother is not making them. Okay, I'm not putting onions in the cupcakes. I brought chocolate chips. I have tomato sauce. I have mustard. I hear some yeses. You guys don't have any. I have some flour. Yes. Yes. I have some vanilla. Yes. Okay. Now, as fun as it might be to play a joke on somebody sometime and make them tomato sauce, taco seasoned, onion mustard cupcakes, okay, for their birthdays. I actually did see somebody post um, that they made um, April Fool's Day cake pops for their kids with Brussels sprouts. <laughs> what a horrible mom joke, right? This way you would never do something like that to your kids, would you? Now, even though we can laugh about what those things might taste like, we love Agni, and we want to bless her with something delicious for her birthday, okay? Not with something gross. And you guys know, even though you might not have the exact recipe down, you know the things that should go in cupcakes. If what I want to produce in my oven today is cupcakes for Agnes' birthday, you know the things that I need to put in those cupcakes. I need to put the right amounts, I need to stir and mix things just right, I need to bake them exactly like the recipe says, because if I don't follow those directions with the right ingredients, I'm not gonna get cupcakes. I'm gonna get something disgusting. And, and that's kind of like this next verse. Um, you know, I thought as we left off Christian's journey um, before break, we talked about how his book is his map, right? And, and just like us, when we're along this journey, we've got to look in our book. We've got to say, what does our book have to do? And Ms. Hoyt's already given us some good references, some good verses from our book. And this next one, so you go ahead and, and click to this slide. Oh, let me ask you these questions first, too. Um, Ms. Hoyt put together some reflections for us to think about. As, as we think about all the, the fun data that you guys have provided and, and the results that we've looked at, um, we need to ask ourselves some questions. You need to ask yourself these questions as you think about the video games you're playing, the music you're listening to, the TV shows you're watching, and those things that you are allowing into that locked heart. What are you unlocking it for? Are those things God honoring? Do they help you build up other Christians? Are they helping you be an encouragement to others? What do the things that you are playing and listening to and watching, what do those say to others who know you that aren't believers in Christ? If they know that you are, but you play certain games or watch certain things or listen to certain songs, what does that say to them? Um, can they tell that you're a Christian by what you watch and listen to and play and what you say no to? Do, you, do your actions and do your choices um, help strengthen your testimony to them? If Jesus was sitting next to you at the next movie you watched or the next song that you listened to, would, would he be pleased with your choice? And what, if anything, do you need to do to change? And when we look a little bit more into our book and into another verse, this verse is from Luke um, chapter 6. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, 
And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. So think about my basket of ingredients. If I put all the right things into that mixture, what I'm going to get out of it is what I intend, right? I'm going to get cupcakes if I use chocolate chips and sugar and oil and eggs. If I put that other stuff, am I going to get cupcakes? No. I'm going to get out of something what I put into it. So if I'm going to get out of myself the right things, the things that are God-honoring and that are pleasing to Him, I need to make sure that the things I'm putting in match up with that. That I have to be putting in the right messages and I have to put, be putting in the, the, the right qualities in order for that to be what comes out. If I'm putting in some of the things, I'm going to read you exactly from some of the ratings okay, that Ms. Hoyt shared with us. Some of the ratings of those higher um, rated video games and movies. If I put in crude humor, if I put in violence, if I put in bad language, adult content, things that are scary, things that are inappropriate, things that are offensive, if I let those things come into my eyes and into my ears, this verse in Luke says, my heart's going to fill up and it's going to spill out what? Is it going to spill out goodness and things that are God-honoring? Not if I'm putting in bad language and scary scenes and violence and things that are offensive. That's not how it works. I'm going to get out what I put into it. If I put out, or if I put those things in, what I'm going to get out of it is I'm probably going to be a dishonest person. I'm probably going to model what I see in those movies and in those TV shows. Do you think if I'm filling my ears with music that has bad language, do you think that's ever going to overflow and spill out and come out of my mouth? Yeah, it is. I'm going to start saying those same bad words. I'm going to start saying those things that dishonor God and that dishonor my classmates and my parents. I'm going to probably take those messages that are violent and that are hurtful. Those things are going to overflow. They're going to spill out and they're going to result in my actions. I'm going to think it's okay to hurt people. I'm going to think it's, it, it's okay to be violent because that's what I'm putting in. So that's what's going to overflow and come out. You know, one of the things that we have to do is, again, look at another part of our book. And so you can move to that next verse. Um, or let me ask you one more thing. And, and I know Ms. Hoyt didn't touch on music ratings, but some of you might have seen in your playlists or um, on different songs that some music has a rating too. Have you ever seen an E by a song? That's a, that's a rating that means explicit. That means it's like an R-rated movie or higher. It's music or it's a song that has lyrics in it or topics in it or maybe scenes from a video that are not things that are appropriate for preteens, things that are appropriate for children. Now, when you think about those movie ratings and, and that scale, you know, Ms. Hoyt talked about how um, at one time there wasn't even the PG-13 and how that has changed. And you might think about those ratings, or especially when it comes to music, okay? Um, you might think, you know what? Well, at least I'm only listening to the song that doesn't have the E rating. I would never listen to that one, but I'll listen to this other one because I really like this artist. They're my favorite singer. Who makes those ratings? Who gives a movie a PG-13 rating? Who gives a, a song an E for explicit rating? Who gives a movie a G rating? Think about that. Where does that come from? And what should we be using as a guide for what we're letting into our hearts and into our ears and into our minds? Our guide should be what? 
What is Christian's map? Grayson's holding it up. Christian's map is this book. Our map is God's word. Do you think any of those ratings come from verses in the Bible? They don't. It's not God's word that gives those ratings and say, oh, this one's just a PG. It's okay for you. Or this isn't an explicit song. It's okay for you to listen to. Those ratings are not given by the same map that we're supposed to be using. So we still need to be, even be extra careful, even when we're deciding on which of those things we want to allow into um, that locked heart. Um, this next verse in Philippians is one that really is our guide for what we should be allowing into our hearts and into our minds. You guys are familiar with this. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, what is noble, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So if you're going to only think about things that are true and right and admirable and praiseworthy, you have to guard your heart and your ears and your video game console and your music sources and your TV watching and listening. You've got to make sure that the things that come in are all of those things too. Because again, my recipe for Agnes cupcakes, I'm going to get out what I put into it. They're not going to taste sweet and chocolatey if I put onions and tomato sauce in there, right? And so if I'm going to think about these things, that Philippians is telling me, I have to put in the same things that I'm going to think about. I have to put in the things that are going to encourage me to act in a way that is excellent and praiseworthy and honoring to God. And so the challenge that you guys have before you is one that Ms. Hoyt already asked you about on the survey a couple weeks ago, and that's something that's called the Christian Music Challenge. And what it is, is 30 days, starting tomorrow, April 9th, through May 8th, that you say, I'm going to commit for 30 days to only listen to music that is Christian. And for some of you, you're going to say, well, that's no big deal. That's all I listen to anyway. Great. Okay? You can still participate in this challenge and still learn a lot through it. Maybe... You read that, and some of you read it and said, no way, I'm not going to do that. Some of you said, well, I'll think about it, I'll try. Well, now, now it's decision time, okay? Today, you've got to decide, because tomorrow we're starting. And what you need to decide on is if you said, you know what, I really don't like Christian music. I like all these other things, and I'm just not willing to give them up. I don't like the songs that we sing in chapel. That's okay. But what I want you to do is challenge yourself to join us because some of the music that you guys are going to hear are not songs that we would sing in chapel because they're not really easy to sing to. And girls, you did an awesome job today on that one that was not so easy to sing to. Okay, Some have lyrics and some have beats and, and some rap parts that are not really easy to join in in praise and worship. But what we're going to do as a part of our challenge is every day in class, yes, put your hands down for just a minute, I'll take some questions at the end. What we're going to do is every day in class for those 30 days, you're going to hear a song from a Christian artist that is probably somebody or maybe somebody that you've never heard of, okay? And tomorrow we're going to start with one that's become a new favorite of mine, a guy who actually has an album dropping tonight at midnight. So I thought, that's perfect. We'll start with his song tomorrow. And you're actually going to listen to two of them. I think you're going to like them. And you might think again, like, I just really don't like that kind of music. Um, but be open to trying it. Maybe you're only going to make it for 15 of the 30 days. Okay? Join us and try and get as much in as you can. And see, though, if your mind can be changed any about what you think Christian music is like. Ms. Hoyt talked about, you know, that sometimes we just think that, well, we just like the, the beat or we just like the, the, um, the artist better. We just don't like those Christian artists. And what we're going to try to do in this 30 days of having you listening 
to different artists and different songs is to try to take some of the favorites that you guys said that you liked and have you listen to some artists that sound very similar to that. But the difference is not so much in the sound of their music. Where do you think the difference comes? What do you think is really the definition of the difference between, like Miss Blake said, Christian music and secular music? It's not in the music part. Eli, what's the difference? Okay, their purpose, yeah, they're doing it as, as an act of worship, for sure. Gracie, what else do you think is the difference? The message and the words, yeah. The music is not so important. It's the, the message behind the lyrics. It's what do those words talk about? And how do they make us feel? How do, what is that overflow? And, and that's what we're going to really focus on. Maybe if you think, you know what, I really don't pay attention to the lyrics. I just like the sound, or I like the look of that group, or the beat, like Ms. Lee talked about. And, but I want you to really consider in the next day, before we start this tomorrow morning, first part of first period, to see if you will join with us and say, you know what, I'll give it a try. I think I don't really pay attention to the words, but I'm willing to give this challenge a try. And, and see if taking 30 days of only listening to songs that have hope and encouragement that we find in scripture helps change your output, helps change your overflow at all, helps change your attitude and your outlook. It's not gonna change challenging situations that we have, but when we put in the right things, it's gonna help us look at those things a little differently. Because again, that verse that we read from Luke says, that what comes out of us, what pours out of us, is that message that we put in. Um, and if you don't want to join us, that's okay. But don't give anybody who's doing it a hard time, okay? To encourage them. Now, some of you might think, too, well, how do I do this, like, in the car? Um, because maybe my parents aren't going to listen to that, or maybe my brother isn't going to want to listen to that. Take tonight and even over the weekend and talk to your family and say, hey, I'm committing to something with my class and I want to give this a try. Would you join with me? And we're going to send all this information home to parents too. So they, they already know a little bit about it, but we're going to give them some more details and even on some of the stations that are listed, some of the streaming services that you can, can kind of tap into to, to get a playlist built and encourage your family to support you in that. And I bet a lot of you will find out that those that they would be willing to give that up themselves and to do it alongside you. And, and even if you're in a situation, maybe it's in a car or you're in a store or you're at a friend's house or something, and they're listening to something else, don't, don't worry and think, oh great, I blew it. I listened to 21 Pilots. I, I, I can't complete the challenge. That's okay because you might be out and about and in different situations where that happens, and that's okay. But as much as you can control the radio dial, and as you can control the playlist on your devices, that you are gonna, for that 30 days, choose those songs, okay? So I would say most of you, just so you know, we didn't put a pie chart up here, um, but I think probably this way, we had at least 80 to 85% of our intermediate students that said, sure, I'm gonna take this challenge, I'm gonna do this, all right? And so I'm encouraging you guys who weren't sure, um, ask your teachers and I about it, and we can tell you a little bit more. And um, we're gonna get started with that tomorrow um, with, like I said, a guy that has a new album. Sound good? Okay, Miss Miller and our praise team, come on up.